I've tried to distill into five pith keys, healing keys, that I think might be helpful to CEOs of conscious companies. In honor of the book, Healing Organizations, I want to talk about these healing keys. And these are things that I've discovered from 35 years, it sounds true. They come from the soil of my experience. This is not theoretical. This is derived upon reflection on what I think has worked, it sounds true, in terms of generating a healing environment and what's been reflected back to me by the 125 or now so employees that we work with at our publishing company. So the first one, the first healing key, is to welcome all emotional experience. Welcome emotions. It may sound pretty obvious, but I think in a lot of organizational environments, only a narrow band of emotions are actually considered welcome. Those emotions in which we're resilient and we have our capacities and we're good and we got it and we're on and let's go. Right? That's the kind of team we want. Those are the people we want. Well, what happens with our grief? Where does it go? Where does it go when members of our family die and we're suffering and we're not at our full capacity? Is it okay to talk about that? Like many organizations, we have a check-in at Sounds True at the beginning of a lot of our meetings. And we have a 13-person leadership team and recently I noticed there was a new member of the leadership team and we were doing the check-in. And this gentleman was looking around and he was kind of like, at what level do I check in? Like, what's really, what's really, what's the norm here? And you know, the first person talked about their stepfather having had a stroke. Somebody else, uh, you know, talked about some, you know, fun vacation they'd been on, but then someone started talking and the floor opened up underneath them because they started crying about something really difficult they were going through. And I could tell that this new employee who was watching this happen was like, OMG, this shit's real. They want you to really talk about what's really happening for you, what's really going on in your heart. And I think if we're gonna have any kind of genuine connection and if something like transparency is not just gonna be a word that we throw around, it's because people feel safe to actually share their genuine emotional experiences, which can be deep and difficult. You know, this year I went through my mother's death and I had no idea, I thought I was ready, she was 93 years old, and I was completely surprised by my experience. And the truth was I was at about 25% of my normal capacity for three months. I was shocked. I didn't think that was going to happen. I, if you had asked me 10 years ago, your mom's going to, I was like, I got this. I've been, I've been prepared for a long time. But that's not actually what happened. And I went into the leadership team. We have a meeting week after week. And week after week, I said, I'm still really suffering. This is really hard for me. I'm somehow so engaged in my mom's process that that's more important to me than anything else that's going on right now. And I need to tell you that. The reason I'm bringing this up as my first key to have a healing organization is that if we want people to take off their masks, the masks that they wear, we have to take off the mask that we wear. And what is that mask hiding? I believe it's often hiding the depth of difficult emotional experience. And there's so much healing that comes when we can be there for each other when we can then say, I'm so sorry you're going through that, man. Can I give you a hug? That's really rough. I'm so sorry. And their heart goes out and you hug each other. That's a healing environment. That's where we bring our love. Because I've heard love mentioned here a couple times, but how do we make it real? How do we make it really real? And it sounds true, I've found that that love gets really real because we meet each other's emotional experience, which is shared, and it's safe to be shared, with our full hearts. So that's my first healing key. Welcome your own emotions and welcome other people's and make space for it. And if you're doing a check-in, go deep. Other people will take their cue from you. 
they will take their cue from you. The depth that you go is the depth that they'll feel comfortable going. You open the door. The second one, second healing key, is to know your blind spot, to look for it, to hunt for it, to go for it. I want to know what I don't see. I don't want to just lead with my strengths and capacities and all of the ways that I'm super gifted, you know, yeah. What, what, what is it that I'm missing? Okay, so how do you know what you're missing? Because the whole point is that you're missing it, right? That's the whole point. It's a blind spot. It's literally blind. How do you know? Get incredible feedback, a lot, from the people you work with, from your family, from your spouse, who knows absolutely everything. Everything. They know everything. If you want to know what your blinds, just ask your partner. You know who else knows everything? I don't have kids, but I watch kids, and they watch the adults, and they know everything. They, they see it all. So ask them things like, what would make our life as a family or our life as a couple more deeply fulfilling? How could I be different? How could you feel loved more by me? You want to make love real. How could, how could there be more love in our house? What would you want from me to be different? That's an incredibly powerful way to know what your blind spots are, is to listen to the people who are close to you. And then, of course, at work, everyone in the room knows. They know. It's not a hunt. Just ask them. And then it's incredibly powerful and healing if you know what that is, and you commit to working on it, really commit to it. You know, my uh, blind spot, and I'm not proud of it, but it had to do with being dismissive and interrupting. And I was dismissive because I thought I wanted to move the meeting forward, get things done, let's go. And a therapist at one point said to me, what do you think the purpose of the meeting is? And I'm like, to get shit done. What do you think the purpose of the meeting is? That's what the purpose of the meeting is. She's like, what if it was about connecting? And by you pushing forward in this way, you're actually losing the connectivity of your team. What if you focused more on connection? So we started working on this as a group. And people even put a jar in the center of the table. And it was every time Tammy interrupts, she's going to put some money in the jar. And we're going to give it to the Sounds True Foundation just to make it real. Everybody has their thing. Everybody, you know, and also especially the stronger you are in certain ways, often the more you have a weakness because they kind of go together. You know, it makes sense. You know, I have an extreme kind of drive. And so that's what created this thing of like, now let's move on. I don't like that idea. Let's, you know, that's what created that. But I had to become painfully aware of how that impacted other people and the hurt that they felt. And I had to make a real commitment to put my heart values first, which is that everybody in the room's hearts count, not just my agenda. OK, my third key. Another great way to know what you don't know is to listen to your body. Let your body be your boss. You're the boss, but no, actually, let your body be the guide, the teacher, the instructor. One of the authors we work with talked about the body as your unconscious mind giving you information all the time. It's taking in everything that's happened. We did this meditation this morning where we experienced the porousness of our body. Well, we're always porous, whether we use the meditation or not. We're taking everything in. Your body's taking in all the stresses. It's taking in all the projections. It's taking in everything. And if you want it to guide and communicate to you, it means that instead of throwing down a couple Excedrin or drinking more coffee or pushing yourself or whatever, you actually say, OK, body, what would actually be healthy for me right now? What do I need? You need to lie down. You need to take a nap. You need to go for a walk. You need to take a week off. You need to go hug your wife. What's your body telling you? And that is your blind spot. It's actually, it's, it's communicating, but we ignore it. We have this idea that we tell our body what to do. Could you please weigh this amount? Could you please have this much whatever? Could you, be, could you look good? Like, we tell our body. 
But when you reverse it and you say, hey, body, could you guide me? Then suddenly your unconscious is becoming conscious and your blind spot is getting worked on all the time because your body is teaching you about what it is. And you become a person who's ready for this, balanced. Because that's what our body's always going for. It wants balance. It wants to feel good. It wants to feel flowy. It wants to feel harmonious. So it's giving us instructions to bring us back to balance. So that's the third key. The fourth key, if you want to make love real at work as a leader, is be willing to confess your screw-ups. Confess. And confess is a strong word. It's a word that comes from holy language from religious language, but I think it's impossible for a person to be healthy who has not fully confessed whatever they need to confess. It's so powerful to be witnessed, and if you stand up in front of a group of employees and you confess, you know, I made the wrong, I just, I, I didn't know. I didn't see it. Or I was in a hurry and I missed it. Or we just plain made the wrong mistake. Or that's part of my own learning, or whatever it is. That confession creates incredible return love towards you. I've seen it happen again and again. Unfortunately, I've had to confess again and again. It sounds true. Uh, it's not. Uh, and now I'm confessing to you about my confessions. Uh, my wife says that I actually have a confession compulsion. Uh, <laughs> I kind of do as a person. I can't. I can't. I don't like to carry guilt. And, and the shame, guilt and shame, and that it's a darkness, actually, to carry it. I don't want to carry it. I want to be light. And the way that I restore my light is to just say, God, I screwed up. I am so sorry. And that's the second part, is apologizing. I don't, I don't think we see enough apology, just real apology. Once again, that's part of the mask, you know? You wear this mask, you don't apologize, right? Because you gotta take the mask off to apologize for real. You take it off and you say, it's not this presentational self. This is the real me and I screwed up. Now, interestingly, because I just wanna make one more footnote on this point about the healing key being apology. Uh, we, will, we work with an organizational psychologist, it sounds true, who helps us resolve various problems. And someone was apologizing to me. And I listened and da da da, and the organizational psychologist looked at me and said, Tammy, do you accept her apology? And I was like, I thought to myself, well, kind of, sort of. Like, I get that she's sincere, but I will always hold that against her. Like, that's what I thought inside. Like, now I know. Now I know who you are. Now I know your spots. Like, I'm not an idiot. You know, you did this thing, da-da-da-da, I get it, you apologized. And I realized that was another part of my problem that I hadn't seen, was that I hold grudges. I hold grudges. Well, that's not a way to be a light and healed and flow person if you're holding a grudge. You know, yeah, I mean, I have my eyes open, but I can also accept her apology. I can forgive her, and I can commit to starting anew. Talk about something that's healing. Starting anew with someone who has hurt you in your business, but who is sincere and who wants to grow, oh my, that is, uh, that's incredibly um, healing. We have one of our core values at Sounds True. I'm not gonna go into all of them, but one of them is the courage to grow and transform. We think of our business as a crucible of personal growth. And if you're gonna have a core value like that, we grow and transform here at work, you're gonna have to be able to both apologize and accept other people's apology. The last uh, healing key I want to point to is engaging in relentless self-care. Now, I know as I say this, this can sound like, you know, a woman going to a spa, sitting in a bath with candles. And it's kind of like, really? Really, you're gonna sit there and talk to me about relentless self-care? But once again, I'm gonna bring up uh, my therapist at one point who was talking to me, and she said, you know, Tammy, the most accomplished athletes are the ones who have the most support. They have trainers, they have someone who's like massaging their calf, before, you know, whatever. You're kind of like a DIYer as a person. You like to do shit yourself. That's kind of how you are. Works better when I do it myself, blah, blah, blah. She's like, you're not, you're, this was a while ago. She's like, you're not really 
going to reach the kind of success you want unless you open up to getting a lot of support, a lot. Take really good care of yourself, and you will be so much better able to take good care of other people. You'll be so much more resourced. And it's just logical, right? Do you know what I mean? It's not like some, this is not miracle thinking. If your bucket is full as a person, you have something to give when the person you run into in the hall is suffering in some way versus being like, God, you know, I'm running on fumes. I got to get back to my desk and, and do whatever. You know, also I was listening, and I just want to share this one thing to Sunny yesterday about, uh, you know, sell your business without selling out. And, you know, I've been at this for 35 years, and one of my mottos has been, really for the last 20 or so years, run the business and have all the joys of selling it without selling it. Now that is a koan. That's a koan, but that's what I want. I don't want to sell my business. You know, I love it. I love running it. It's a great platform. I enjoy it. We're contributing in the world. It's a message platform for what I care about. And I want to be able to spend the summers in British Columbia on a weird remote island and kayak a lot. I want to be able to go, and I have historically gone on these month-long meditation retreats. I want to be able to have a lot of freedom. And it's possible, but it's a type of creative rethinking of what a healing organization is, and an organization that will allow me as the founder to be healed while I run it and not project myself into the future sale date. Oh, that's when I'll be healed, when I get all that money and then I can do all the things I want. No, I want each step of the way to be a beauty walk. And for me to have that uh, kind of joy and sense of accomplishment while continuing to run the business. So those were the five healing keys I wanted to cover. When you welcome your emotions, you become emotionally congruent, and people can feel it. Oh, wow, people are emotionally congruent around here. When you know your blind spot, you are living in a crucible of growth, and it accelerates your growth, the growth of your employees, and the growth of uh, your customers, too, because of the creativity that you have to touch them. Uh, when you listen to your body, you're embodied. That's a big part of being congruent. When you confess, you become a humble. Just one more two-legged, you know, which is what we are. Uh, and then when you prioritize your sanity, which is another way of saying prioritize your self-care, relentless self-care, you prioritize your sanity, you actually become sane and your business becomes sane. And then my final point, which is kind of like an extra key that I just want to throw in there, which is if we want to talk about what does it mean to create love in the world and to have love in our workplaces, I know for me, what I love the most is the truth. That's what I love the most. When somebody comes up to me and they tell me the truth in any situation, I love the truth. That's why Sounds True is called Sounds True. I love the sound of the truth. I love the feeling of the truth. I love it when someone's a truth teller. Not everybody loves when I start sucking the truth, but that's okay. Uh, I love the truth. And anything you can do to speak the truth and invite the truth into your organizations, you'll create trust with the people you work with. And I believe that speaking and hearing the truth creates love and healing. So thank you. <laughs>